You're very welcome to this series of five videos covering the August 2018 management case study pre-scene. The pre-scene is based on a camera manufacturer by the name of Montel and we'll go through five videos that cover the pre-scene in depth, highlighting the key issues as they come up throughout the pre-scene, linking them to your objective studies, uh, E2, F2 and P2, relating them to the real life industry and talking about potential exam issues and how you can respond to those issues should they come up on exam day. So we're going to cover this content in five videos, as I said. The first video will deal with pages two to eight of the pre-scene document. So we'll talk through the introduction, uh, the camera industry section, the types of digital photographic uh, equipment as well. Then in the second video, we'll cover pages nine to 14 of the pre-scene, uh, starting with a look at uh, Montel's product range before we see how they manufacture uh, the very vital component uh, of the lenses that go into their cameras. Uh, then we'll have a look at the costings for those uh, lenses before we take a look at how they manufacture the bodies for their cameras. The third video then will take uh, a look at uh, pages 15 to 20 of the pre-scene uh, and also the last two pages of the pre-scene document which cover the four articles at the end of this pre-scene. Uh, pages 15 to 20 will cover first of all Montel's distribution channels where they're selling their cameras before we look at the group strategy and structure and then we'll consider uh, the revenue sources for the company as well as uh, talking through the main competitors that Man Man Montel has. In the fourth video we'll be uh, dealing exclusively with the financial statements uh, and also the short uh, section on the management accounts for the company. We'll also be looking at uh, an extract of the financial statements for one of Montel's main rivals, uh, a company by the name of Kira. And then in the fifth and final video, what we'll do is we'll summarize uh, all of the main issues, uh, the ones we really think uh, are particularly important, coming from each of the sections we'll have viewed in the first four videos. So that final summary video is a nice way to conclude things. And we'll be rounding out that particular video with the SWOT analysis, looking at the strengths, weaknesses and opportunities and threats uh, that Montel is faced with. Okay then, in this first video, we'll be looking at pages two to eight of the pre-scene document, starting with a look at the introduction to this company, where it's based, uh, what it does, a little bit about its history, and uh, a, bit, a bit about your role as a financial manager within the company. Then we'll be talking about the camera industry itself, what it is that uh, makes a digital camera work, um, the different components that go into a digital camera. And we'll talk about some sales trends over the last seven or eight years. They're not particularly good. Um, and the position of Montel within the camera industry. Then we'll finish out this video with a look at the different types of digital uh, cameras, the DSLR cameras that are a, particularly, a particular specialty of this company, Montel and we'll talk about the other types of camera that they're producing. Okay then, so starting with the introductory section, we're told that Montel is a quoted multinational camera manufacturer that was founded in the 1920s. So this is a company with staying power. It's been around the block and it has lived through some big changes in the industry. One of the most notable would have been the uh, change from film cameras uh, to digital cameras in the 1980s. And it has been successful throughout those changes. And currently it's dealing with the threat from smartphones to its lower end models. Uh, and we'll talk about that as we meet it. So this is a company that's been around for a long time. The fact that it's a quoted multinational manufacturer uh, means obviously that it's going to be a publicly listed company and there are pros and cons with being a publicly listed company. 
uh, among the pros of being a publicly listed company would be access to more financing. Um, you can tap shareholders for investment if you want to make um, some uh, big investments of your own in the company. Um, also, there are reputational benefits that undoubtedly come with being a publicly listed company. Uh, on the other hand, though, there are compliance issues to consider. You need to uh, churn out quarterly accounts. They need to be audited. Uh, you are subject to a degree of public scrutiny that you would not be subject to if you were a, a privately run company. And of course, there's shareholder pressure. They're putting their money into your company. They're going to want to return either in the form of a, an appreciating share price and or healthy dividends. So there are expectations. People are watching. Banking analysts, investment analysts are asking tough questions of your CEO uh, in quarterly calls, etc. Uh, also, the fact that it's mentioned here that Montel is a multinational manufacturer, uh, this means that they're uh, geographically uh, diversified. They're not reliant on just one market. And we'll see that they're present uh, throughout the world and they are present in a number of different regions. Um, we are also, it, this, uh, this fact that they're a multinational company leads us to think of uh, what we would have seen in uh, your E2 studies relating to globalization and the increasing interde interdependence of countries due to increased trade, uh, increased capital flows, and the rapid diffusion of technology, which can be both a, an opportunity for companies like Montel, but also a threat. So we're dealing with a global uh, marketplace. Now, interestingly, in recent times with Donald Trump coming to power in the United States, um, the previously um, accepted norms relating to international trade have come under attack a little bit. There has been um, uh, talk of uh, trade tariffs going up, and indeed they have gone up, uh, and it's been a bit of a tit-for-tat type situation over the last few weeks with uh, America uh, enacting uh, tariffs on, on Chinese goods and European goods and Europe responding in kind and China responding in kind. Let's see where that leads us. My uh, suspicion is it'll lead us nowhere good. It'll, um, it'll actually lead to more stagnant economic growth um, and it could lead to more serious disputes occurring. But the general trend over the last uh, 20, 30 years has been towards ever-increasing international trade, and a company like Montel has taken advantage of that trend to sell all over the world. So, uh, we're told that Montel manufactures high-quality cameras. They're aimed at professional photographers and serious amateurs. And these cameras then are sold through specialist camera shops, upmarket department stores, and electronic shops. We'll see that they're uh, distribution reach is pretty extensive later in the pre-scene and um, that it is also quite costly to sell to these professional photographers and serious amateurs. They expect a good deal of customer service. They are very, these are very high-end cameras and they're very, very expensive uh, cameras. So it's also costly to serve this particular uh, customer segment. And Montel, we're told, is based in a developed country uh, by the name of Farland. It's a fictional country. Uh, we don't have too many clues throughout the pre-scene as to which country it could be based on. We might be tempted to say uh, it's based on Japan, given the fact that a number of the world's biggest camera manufacturers reside in Japan. Canon is the one that really comes to mind. And also when we see the... Um, the structure of the company, the organization, we'll see that there are a lot of Japanese sounding names in the hierarchy of senior management. Also, though, there are more European sounding or American sounding names mixed in as well. So it's, it's very hard to, to say uh, which uh, country it is definitely based on. It's, it seems to be a mix of different developed countries. What we can say about Farland is that it uh, has many high-tech and electronic industries and also has world-class 
universities and those universities are very strong in the areas of electronics engineering programming we think of porter's diamond uh, and advanced factor conditions such as a very educated uh, workforce and obviously it's going to be beneficial to a company like montel to be able to tap into that very educated work force uh, they're churning out uh, pretty high tech pieces of equipment innovation is going to be important and also the fact that they're uh, close to a number of world-class universities is uh, advantageous it means that they could uh, go to those university departments and uh, collaborate on research and development and indeed tap those universities for future employees farland's currency we're told is the fictional currency of uh, the f dollar uh, there are going to be implications there if they're dealing with international trade and if they have subsidiaries perhaps in other countries there would be the issue of converting foreign currencies into the uh, home currency there'll be transactions uh, in foreign currencies that need to be uh, translated then into the home currency of the f dollar so we wonder maybe are they uh, hedging carefully for uh, potential adverse movements in uh, their currency compared to other major currencies like the euro or us dollar for example and the financial statements are prepared in accordance with international financial reporting standards moreover we're told that the farland stock exchange has particularly highly developed rules concerning corporate governance so that goes back to the issue i mentioned at the start that as a quoted company there are uh, a number of onerous regulations and it seems that the farland stock exchange is even more onerous perhaps than other stock exchanges so they're really uh, the authorities would be keeping a close eye on companies like Montel that are listed and they have lots of probably uh, uh, hoops to jump through uh, in ensuring that their corporate governance is in check etc we see in the last section then that you are a financial manager at the head office of Montel and you're primarily dealing with management accounting uh, you report to the senior financial manager who in turn reports to the finance director so I just want to mention a couple of things re regarding the role of the financial manager in the management case study exam. First of all, you're going to have a medium term focus. So we're talking about a time frame of maybe one to three years. At the operational case study level, it's a short term focus you'd have as a finance officer. So that's typically less than one year. And at the strategic level, you're dealing with longer periods. You're looking to make recommendations, strategic recommendations that would deal with uh, issues that affect the company over five years or more. So at the, this level, you're talking about the midterm. So one to three years typically. So you'll be asked to think about what are the appropriate investments to make in which products, what would their prices be over the medium term. You'll be dealing with risk uh, um, as it pertains to those investments and those products and prices, etc. Uh, again, over the medium term. Um, you'll be asked to monitor the implementation of strategy. So rather than coming up with the strategies, the long-term strategies for the company itself, you will be asked by your superiors, your directors, etc., um, to look out for the implementation of the strategy. So you'll be dealing with people underneath as well. They'll be uh, executing the strategy on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas you'll be stepping back a little bit and seeing that the uh, overseeing the implementation of that uh, long-term strategy. Because you're looking at uh, bigger investments uh, in products. Uh, etc you'll be dealing with longer term financing so some long term uh, loans and securing uh, financing through uh, share issues etc you'll be dealing with more advanced financial reporting uh, for example this is a company with subsidiaries they have consolidated financial statements that we'll be looking at later on and that leads to a more complex set of financial reports because you are higher up the food chain than you were at the operational level, you'll no longer be dealing with um, the uh, managers lower down the hierarchy. You'll be dealing with some top management. So you'll be dealing with finance directors. You might be dealing even with the CFO or even on occasion with the CEO himself. You'll be asked as well at this level to consider 
the environment in which your company operates and the stakeholders that are affected, not just internal stakeholders, but stakeholders outside of the business. So if your company is embedded in a local community, you'd be asked to think about the local community, for example. You'd be asked to think about your suppliers, your customers, obviously, uh, but the wider economic developments that affect your company as well, and maybe as well the um, uh, there'd be political players that you'll be uh, dealing with that would have an interest uh, in your uh, business. Over the next couple of pages, then, we're told about the camera industry. And we're told in this first paragraph that uh, cameras are basically optical devices that capture images. And the images can take the form of still photographs or if they're, if they're uh, taken in quick succession, if the images are captured in quick succession, uh, then you have a video being played back. And Montel is in the business of still photographs. So there's no mention of... Uh, video capabilities with their cameras and um, it's a potential uh, opportunity maybe for the company to consider that their cameras would double up also uh, to allow for the capture of videos. There was an important development in the 1980s with the advent of digital cameras. So they were similar in lots of ways to traditional film cameras but what happened was the film was it was replaced with an electronic sensor and this made things far more convenient to people looking to uh, publish their photos um, or to send them to uh, different interested parties and it was a lot cheaper more convenient and um, so with digital cameras you have a sensor that captures light um, from the the subject that is being photographed and the light then uh, enters the camera and the electronics in the camera transfer the data uh, from the sensors that are set up to capture this light um, to the camera's memory and this memory uh, takes the form of a removable memory card so the uh, resulting image we're told can be viewed on a, a screen or printed out uh, on traditional uh, as a traditional paper photograph but it's largely the same technology today as uh, in the early 80s just before the advent of digital cameras except that the the film is being replaced with this uh, sensor uh, and a removable memory card hobbyists interestingly now prefer to view images instantly on the phone screen when you think about uh, some high-end cameras, the display is actually quite small. And with smartphones now, they've been getting bigger and bigger. It's actually more comfortable to view the image instantaneously. And this is representing a threat. Smartphones in general, they're going to come up again and again throughout this pre-scene. As we see, they represent a threat to camera companies like Montel. Particularly at the low end of the market for more co compact cameras. Not so much the uh, professional cameras that a company like Montel is particularly uh, skilled at making. So below this, uh, these two paragraphs, we have uh, an illustration as to what goes on when a, a camera, a digital camera, uh, captures an image. We have a, an image of a bird there. So the light from the subject is captured, we're told, to create the photograph. The lens is adjusted to focus on the subject. If it isn't adjusted, it could be blurry. Uh, so there is a little bit of skill required there. Uh, in more basic camera models, the ones uh, aimed at amateurs, um, the uh, lens can automatically adjust. There isn't much uh, tinkering with the lens to take place, but professional cam uh, camera men and camera women like to have the option of adjusting the lens. Uh, the shutter then opens briefly to allow light in from the subject and the light comes in uh, and it reaches the sensor array. The sensor array then converts that light into an electronic signal and the electronic signal is processed by the camera's electronics and is recorded on a memory card. So that, there are the different steps that take place uh, when capturing an image with a digital camera. We're told then in the next paragraph that the quality of cameras varies significantly with a wide range of prices to match. So it's made up of physical components, electronic uh, components as well are very very important so the physical components um, 
such as the lens, the shutter, uh, they uh, are very, very important components. And the better made they are, the less distortion there is with the image and the more focused the image uh, actually is. And the better the component parts, the physical component parts, the greater the control and the more precise results um, that the photographer can achieve. There are electronic components as well that go uh, into these cameras. They're developed actually in-house, we're told later on, by Montel. Uh, there are an increasing number of sensors, for example, that capture ever finer details and produce superior results. And there was a bit of an arms race uh, uh, in previous years to get as many megapixels into cameras as you possibly could. We're told that in the early days of digital photography, manufacturers were competing to uh, increase the number of sensors, and then that would uh, that we were told that that uh, translated to a greater number of megapixels. But actually, uh, that trend stopped when people found out that there was a physical limit to the number of megapixels. And what happened was they were trying to stuff in as many megapixels as possible into the cameras, and it was affecting the quality of the pictures in the end. So they abandoned that uh, arms race. Digital cameras on the next page, we're told, rapidly replaced film cameras. And that's because film cameras were... Uh, they required expensive film and also the processing of that film uh, was inconvenient, it was time consuming, uh, it was costly to do that as well. And uh, we're told that photographers, they like to share their pictures uh, on social media sites, uh, etc. And they like to send their work to clients electronically and obviously the digital cameras allow them to do that. They're also able to discard images more easily. If you have to pay for expensive film, you can only take so many pictures. You have to be careful and ration uh, your uh, film, but with digital cameras, you can take and discard as many pictures as you want. So expense and inconvenience really made film cameras obsolete. And uh, this technical innovation early in the 80s with digital cameras um, completely disrupted film cameras and made them uh, obsolete. And I wonder if something similar is happening now with smartphones. Certainly, I think smartphones are making compact cameras and bridge cameras, which we'll look at shortly, uh, somewhat obsolete. And I think they'll eventually disappear. There isn't much of an argument for them with the advent of smartphones. Uh, paradoxically, we're told in the next paragraph, uh, the advent of digital camera uh, photography has led to a decline in the camera industry. And that's because photographs are often shared through social media sites. And uh, those social media sites actually only accept uh, limited sizes of files. And the files uh, that are uh, produced by uh, the um, high-end cameras in particular are quite large due to the number of megapixels, etc., and detail that goes uh, with the cameras or with the photos that those cameras actually capture. Uh, so many amateurs, as, as a result, are not actually at, at in, that interested in buying the expensive models with their huge megapixel counts and their big size files for the different photos. So they go for uh, uh, lower-end cameras instead or increasingly they just opt to take cameras with their their own smartphones their lower resolution the file the file sizes are smaller they can upload them to different social media sites which is uh, good enough for uh, lots of amateur enthusiasts maybe there's an opportunity for a company like montel to compress the size of image files without comprising quality although that represents a significant uh, technical challenge um, for a company like Montel. And here we come to it explicitly. The upsurge in smartphones has had a huge impact in recent years on camera sales. Phone cameras have really increased in quality to a point where the results are deemed satisfactory by many users. Uh, so good enough is good enough. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter that smartphones haven't got uh, the same image quality as the high-end models. That's not what most people are looking for. They're happy with a pretty solid picture. They just want to share it with their loved ones and share it with their friends, often uh, um, through social media uh, networks. 
moreover as well, the fact that smartphones are always available, they slip into your pocket, um, they're multifunctional, it just adds to the convenience of uh, opting for your smartphone to be your principal uh, means of taking photographs. Rather than having to uh, carry around a heavy, cumbersome um, device that only serves one function uh, in the form of a camera, the only function it serves is actually taking photographs. So we're told there that the uh, photographs from smartphones are connected to the internet. They can be uh, directly uploaded, immediately uploaded from the phone to internet sites. And uh, again, maybe there's an opportunity for a company like Montel to ensure that their cameras have internet connectivity uh, features as standard. Uh, that would uh, help somewhat. But really, their um, low-end models, I think, are facing... Um, are facing a, a huge decline and will continue to do so, I think, until they disappear. And that is borne out by the evidence that we see below. Global sales of digital cameras have been declining hugely since 2010. They've declined in terms of their revenues 40% since 2010. That doesn't really show any signs of slowing down. Um, having said that, Montel and its big rival, Kira, uh, utterly dominate the uh, segment of the market that focuses on professional cameras. So these are very, very high-end, uh, high-quality cameras. They're uh, under far less threat from smartphones because realistically professional photographers are not going to be interested in trading in their high-end cameras for uh, much less powerful smartphones. So 97% of professional photographers, were told, use either a Montel or Akira camera. Very, very high quality cameras. So uh, we can assume that given the fact that they're so high quality, that they're going to be very high cost also to produce and that the company needs to be charging very premium prices to cover their costs and make a profit too. We are told that both Montel and Kira produce several less expensive ranges also. Um, to suit the needs of photographers who cannot afford to spend thousands of F dollars on a camera. Um, but even though these uh, are less expensive ranges, they still push for these models to be uh, at the, uh, the high end in terms of quality compared to their rivals. So overall, we've got to say that if Montel and Kira's uh, customers are going to be less price sensitive than uh, than customers of other companies but on the flip side they're likely to be very demanding as well and that is certainly going to be the case with professional photographers so if you think of Porter's generic strategies whether a company is a cost leader uh, with a broad or narrow focus or whether they're differentiated with a broad or narrow focus it seems that uh, these two companies Montel and Kira uh, are differentiated they're going for a premium offer and their focus is quite broad given the fact that they're uh, present across all of the different camera types or almost all of the different camera types we're told then that several other camera manufacturers offer um, very inexpensive models and they would be uh, cost leaders or have a cost focus perhaps under uh, Porter's generic strategies and then there is this um, group of manufacturers that fall somewhere in the middle uh, and they're perhaps in danger of getting stuck in the middle uh, to use Porter's terminology and um, they come close enough, we're told, to Montel and Kira in terms of the quality, but they have slightly lower prices. Uh, but none of these uh, mid-range manufacturers make cameras aimed at the professional market. And I think actually that they may be in most danger um, of uh, falling away completely. We know that Porter says that those companies that are stuck in the middle, it's a bad place to be. You either want to be differentiated or to be a cost Leader. So maybe there's an opportunity for a company like Montel to go in and snap up some of these companies on the cheap or maybe acquire some of their assets on the cheap uh, as they disappear. And then we have some niche manufacturers like Rug Cam. They produce miniature cameras for extreme sports. You think of the real life example of GoPro, which was proving quite popular uh, a few years ago. They're shock and water resistant. So that's a nice little niche. Um, because they do something that smartphones at the moment anyway can't do. Smartphones are altogether more delicate. You're not going to take them out in your surfboard. Um, so Rugcam 
it has a nice little niche for itself there. Let's round out this video then with a look at the types of digital photographic equipment. First of all, we start with the big daddy of cameras, DSLR cameras. These are digital single lens reflex cameras, very expensive and considered the very best. So professional photographers and serious enthusiasts are the, uh, the customer segment for the DSLR cameras. So they get their name uh, as a single lens camera because they have just one lens that serves uh, two functions. Uh, it serves as both the sensor that captures the image and it also serves the photographer uh, as the viewfinder. So the photographer is able to look at the, uh, the image and they get, they're guaranteed that the final image will be close to what the photographer is actually seeing through the viewfinder. So there'll be greater accuracy uh, when it comes to taking pictures and getting the desired result. Uh, it's gonna be a more complex of lens, of course, because it serves uh, a number of functions. It's not just doing one thing or another, it's doing two things. It's capturing the image and serving as a viewfinder. So the photographer sees the same image that will be captured when the shutter is released and that is advantageous to a, a professional photographer. The alternative is that you're looking uh, at a viewfinder that bears no relation or very little relation to the final image and that would just be very frustrating, very time consuming. Uh, professional photographers uh, only have a second um, to uh, get the uh, image that they want, especially if they're covering something like sports, for example. They don't have time to be setting up their cameras and wondering whether the shot uh, that they're about to take is going to, uh, is going to produce the desired result or not. So they're willing to pay more for this special type of single lens. So DSLR cameras, we're told, have removable lenses, and the lens is a hugely expensive part of the final complete uh, product. And there are different lenses, we're told, for different uh, scenarios. For example, you could have a telephoto lens, which is apt for taking photographers uh, of a very distant subject, or you could have a wide angle lens, which per permits more of the subject to be fitted into the shot when taking pictures from close range. So great opportunity for a company like Montel to upsell different standalone lenses, which indeed it does. It produces three different lenses. And different camera manufacturers, we're told, have their own standard lens mountings. So the mounting is part of the camera. It's the fitting you see there in the image that is to receive the lens. And what we're told is that uh, mountain lenses will not necessarily fit in other manufacturers' cameras and vice versa. So what's happening here is that a company like Montel is able to lock in customers. As soon as a, com a customer comes and buys one of these high-end cameras, they're stuck with uh, Montel branded lenses for the foreseeable future. They can't go off and buy lenses elsewhere. And that actually increases the switching costs for customers. So they're tying in the customer for the medium to long term. That's quite desirable to a company like Montel, especially given how expensive these lenses actually are. So if you have a professional camera who needs multiple lenses as well, they're going to have to buy them all from Montel once they purchase a Montel camera. And the uh, manufacturers like Montel, they sell the body of the camera as a separate uh, product, but often uh, as part of a kit. So you'll get the, the camera body plus one or two compatible lenses. And as a professional photographer, you might need to purchase uh, two or three more lenses, depending on the types of uh, pictures you're going to be taking. So we have a section then on the lenses uh, and they make a huge difference to the quality of the photographs that are taken. Uh, and it all depends upon the precision with which the glass that goes into the lenses is shaped and mounted. And we'll see in a while that Montel uses the highest quality glass, optical glass, in all of their lenses. That adds expense, but uh, contributes greatly to the higher quality uh, that they uh, want for their cameras. DSLR lenses are generally optimized for specific purposes. Uh, so a lens 
uh, that's suitable for a close-up photograph uh, at a sporting event is unsuitable for, unsuitable for, you know, taking a portrait shot in a studio. And that's just wonderful for a company like Montel because it justifies them selling multiple lenses. Wouldn't do it all if they had one lens that served for everything. Uh, better to be able to sell five or six different lenses to uh, photographers. So what else are high quality lenses used in? Just to give uh, you some ideas of some of the other areas that a company like Montel could be looking to diversify into. Well, telescopes, for example, use very high quality lenses and binoculars as well need high quality lenses. So there are uh, a couple of different product categories that a company like Montel would do well to look at. And I do think Montel needs to start looking elsewhere if they're going to grow their revenues. So the retail prices, unsurprisingly, of lenses varies very significantly. Uh, the better the lens, the better the, photo the photograph because you're going to have a more accurate image with less distortion. So it's going to be more focused, more precise. And photographers are willing to pay a premium to get a lens that is only slightly better. So you might be paying five times the price uh, for a lens over the next best lens, but the uh, lens would only actually be two times better. That to me is an indication that there's actually some way to go in terms of improving the production process for lenses. There's a gap maybe there, an opportunity for a disruptive company to come in and say, okay, if you're going to pay five times the price, you're going to get a lens that is five times better, that it's not just going to be incrementally better. It seems that the customers of these companies are kind of settling, uh, settling for less. If I was paying five or 10 times the price uh, for a lens that was just uh, two times better or three times better, I'd be a little bit disappointed with that. Okay, so that's the big daddy of the camera world dealt with DSLR cameras. What about the other options? Well, compact system cameras are an interesting one, CSCs, because while they are currently slightly less sophisticated than DSLRs, they do share a number of features with the uh, the highest end DSLR cameras. Uh, first of all, you have an ability to exchange lenses so you can match the lens to the type of shot that you're taking. And that's very desirable for any serious photographer. Um, they have a big benefit in that they're smaller and lighter to carry around than DSLR equivalents. And they also cost less. Uh, they we're told that they're purchased by enthusiasts who uh, don't want, want the uh, the uh, big prices associated with DSLR cameras, and they don't want to be dragging around a very, very heavy DSLR camera. Uh, having said that, even though they are uh, less expensive, they are still quite expensive. Now, interestingly, their popularity is actually growing very steadily. And we'll see later on that Montel has just kind of dipped its toes in with the production of compact system cameras, but so far, uh, they are seeing very good gross profit margins in this category. In fact, they represent the best gross profit margins that the company currently has out of all its product categories. We'll see that when we look at the financial statements. And technically, these cameras are getting closer and closer to DSLR cameras, and they're becoming quite acceptable to professional uh, photographers. So I wouldn't be surprised to see in the next uh, two, three, five years, these cameras become the go-to option for um, professional photographers and more and more uh, for th these to be uh, the big seller uh, for the most serious photographers. And then the next two categories of camera are lower end, but uh, they offer convenience, uh, but I do think they're going to disappear over the next five to 10 years. First of all, you have bridge cameras. They bridge the gap in terms of quality and versatility between DSLRs at the high end and the most basic compact cameras at the low end. Um, they have non-replaceable lenses, so there's no opportunity to upsell to customers in that way. You're stuck with the lens that you have. One size fits all. They do have a zoom function. Uh, it's more powerful than the zoom function on the, the most basic compact cameras, but it's altogether less powerful than the zoom function on the compact system cameras and the DSLR uh, cameras. 
They are being phased out in favor of CSCs, we're told, which are more versatile. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, issues come up on exam day relating to um, pulling resources out of the production of bridge cameras. Uh, there may be divestments, uh, assets being sold off, um, and maybe there would be redundancies as well associated with the um, the people working at Montel on bridge cameras. Maybe there'd be a transfer of staff and resources to other areas like compact system, compact system cameras. Uh, it's interesting though, and we'll see in the financial uh, results, that the bridge cameras actually represent the second best revenue uh, category for the company and the best revenue performer is actually the most basic compact cameras uh, but they are in big decline and that is a problem for the company. Finally then we deal with the compact cameras. These are the most basic cameras produced by Montel. Uh, they are known as point and shoot. There isn't a lot of sophistication uh, in the users that buy these cameras typically they're interested in minimal fuss you just point the camera you take a picture there's no messing around with changing lenses or adjusting the focus uh, you just kind of point and hope for the best uh, still the most important revenue generator for Montel but in steep decline as I said and that is a big problem um, so really I think though the uh, the area that is covered by compact cameras the uh, the appeal of these compact cameras is their convenience how easy they are to use and I think it covers the desire for the vast majority of people that are looking to take photos uh, unfortunately for a company like Montel that uh, desire is now fulfilled by smartphones but uh, we're told that uh, the compact cameras are small enough to fit in a jacket pocket they're convenient as a result. Well, big deal because smartphones are just as small and just as convenient to slip into your jacket pocket. Uh, the small size does impose constraints in terms of sensors and lenses that can be fitted. There are only so many components you can pack into a, a tiny little ca camera like this. Fortunately, there are only so many um, uh, hardware components and electronic components you can actually fit into a smartphone so smartphones might be hitting the upper limit of what they can do in terms of photog photographic excellence so that is good news uh, for the higher end models that Montel produces um, but there's no getting away from the threat that smartphones represent. Smartphones we're told are fitted with cameras that can rival compact cameras in terms of quality and as a result compact compact cameras are in rapid decline. So this business segment seems to be disappearing. What is Montel going to do about that?